Europe and the United Kingdom are grappling a gas crisis. We also have a potential tightening of monetary policy by the Fed. Uh, the world economy seems to be heading to a funk. Now, how do we understand it from an emerging market or an India perspective? We have the best of guests on Indianomics today. I have with me Lord Meghnath Desai, the Indian-born British economist, member of the Labour Party for, what, 50 years? And, uh, of course, someone who has kept very close track of British politics even today. Lord Desai, thank you very much indeed for joining thank me you. today. So, first, I want you to interpret uh, the global economy for us. Uh, this gas crisis, uh, uh, does it uh, mean that we are going to have a longish bit of stagflation in Europe? And what will that mean for emerging markets? Well, you know, <clears throat> I believe in a very old-fashioned way in what are called long cycles. Okay. The contractive you know, cycle, as contractive you say. The contractive cycle. I learned all this. In India, under Brahmanand, he uh, taught us when we were doing business cycles. In Bombay University. Yeah, yes. and, and Schumpeter, in Schumpeter's two volume book on business cycles. Now, Conrady, because it's a 50 year cycle, when he was writing, there had only been two. Now we have had a few more. So we have a little bit more confidence. I lived through one Conrady cycle already in the 1970s. May I interrupt you for a minute, sir? Uh, just to tell viewers that the Kondratif cycle, uh, economist Kondratif believed in 50-year cycles. He looked at agricultural commodities, at copper, and said that they normally move in 50-year cycles. So 50 years ago, in the 70s, there was a long period of stagflation. Sorry for no. the interruption, but so, tell no, us. No, sir. no, you, you, this is a footnote, you know, you have to keep footnotes. Yes. Now, you see, so 70s to about end of 80s. We had a serious inflationary crisis. All the countries had inflationary crisis. The paradigm changed from Keynesian economics to monetary economics. You know, we had full employment, then unemployment became the cure for inflation. And everybody was caught into it. It's a global problem. Yes. The global problem was triggered by an energy price rise. Yes. Very much like at present, energy oil price quadrupled. <coughs> You know, when the OPEC people... Early 70s. Yeah. Oil price had not changed from 1918 to 1972. Oh, okay. And it quadrupled. Partly because the dollar had depreciated when America went off the dollar gold yes, thing. gold stand. Uh, but, you know, think of dollar, gold was $35 an ounce and what price it is right now. Yes. You know, we have lived through a lot of inflation. But... It didn't go away very quickly. For a while, we tried uh, Keynesian policies and so on, Phillips goes on. But ultimately, the monetarists came to power in the 1980s. Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, Helmut Kohl. Paul Volcker. Paul Volcker, and Paul Volcker. And Paul Volcker got in there and increased interest rates like nobody's business. And the idea was, without ex real pain, there is no cure to inflation. There are no easy ways out of stagflation. And in a sense, we learned a lot at that time. I mean, uh, the new prime minister of Britain, Liz Truss, thinks Margaret Thatcher cut taxes. Margaret Thatcher did not cut taxes till after a third victory. You know, in the late, late 1980s, you know, she allowed uh, Nigel Lawson to cut taxes. But until then, they paid unemployment benefit out of Nazi oil, out of, uh, out of selling national industries. National assets, yes. Railways. All that money disappeared in paying unemployed. But that was a cost of fighting inflation, and that cost had to be borne. The cost but, of fighting yeah. inflation was creating unemployment. Without, without, without so growing the economy now. Now, I wish it was there's a better way, and I have, I've always fought monetarism and all that. But here I'm in the second conductive cycle of my life. Okay, again, energy prices have risen. We have added a war to it this time. Last time we didn't, we didn't have a serious. There's an Arab-Israeli war, but that was not. No, not kind of global scale. So now we have a Russia-Ukraine war. 
which is unfortunately not going to end soon. I think it's going to go on for four years. That, that, that's my estimate. And we don't know whether the Taiwan thing will, will flare up or not. If the Taiwan thing flares, then all, all, all bets are off. <laughs> so we have an oil price rise, uh, energy price rise, which without any other thing will cause us taxation. And if you add war to it. So difficult times are coming ahead. I don't want to be an optimist. I want to be a pessimist. I want to tell people, don't think, and don't think it's just happening to India. It's happening to the whole world. Yeah, but uh, Lord Desai, you know, in the in the 70s, we had our own problem. I mean, we had a huge grain crisis. The Green Revolution really took off thereafter. Yeah. Uh, we uh, we had our problems. Right now, Asia seems to be in a better spot. Uh, inflation is not uh, as yeah. bad. I mean, we are in the six handle, whereas uh, the West is in eight or nine percent handles. Uh, as well, growth is not so badly affected. So do you think Asia and India may get away with the uh, smaller bruises? I don't know which part of the globe you're going to live in. <laughs> you know, what, what makes people think somehow we can globalize when we like and we can deglobalize when we like, we'll globalize for good things and deglobalize for bad things? You know, I mean, I it think, doesn't work I like think that. I would rather that people start pessimistically okay. than they write optimistically. You know, you know, I, I always, even in my personal life, I think, what what is the prepare for the extreme worst. cost of the you know, what's what's the maximal cost? Now, maximal loss, because that prepares you to be cautious about these things, and you don't get into false optimism, oh, we are different from everybody else. You know, a lot of India's problem is we are different from everybody else. We have a different kuchne. We are like everybody else. And, you know, even, even when you talk about, about the, the Green Revolution, the Green Revolution did not come anything that happened in the world. We had two famines. Yes. 64, 65, 65, 67. So yes. I had left the country in 61. but. We were very non the line that we didn't like the Americans, but we were eating American wheat. Yes. You know, PL 480. Uh, and then, because all through the 50s, we thought agriculture is all right. We want to have land reform and this and that. It all thought to be a distribution problem in agriculture. It was a productivity Production problem. Properties. And for the productivity problem, we had to rely on the private sector, farmers. Yes. You know, we didn't, the planning commission had nothing to do with it. We gave the farmers incentives, and the farmers paid us back. Yes. Now, what that means, I'm sorry, I'm going to continue. We showed faith in the private sector. And I think we need, once again, to show that it's the private sector which is going to show the problem. Yes, government should have a policy perspective, a long-run policy perspective, uh, and basically let private sector solve the problem. Okay. I'm coming to India and the uh, you know, stress on public and private in a minute. Let me just finish the global scenario. The U.S. at the moment, uh, uh, you know, probably the European economy has less of an impact on the world compared to the United States. Yeah. There, the labor market is very strong. So you think even over there, uh, the government and the Fed will have to slow down the economy so much that uh, well, you see, what's happening to the labor market because of the pandemic is a very interesting long run adjustment because quite a lot of people are taking early retirement. Yes. You know, both, both in America and in Europe. What happens to a lot of people, especially uh, over there, if you have a pension, pensionable job, and if you own your place of residence, the profit you will make from the selling that and mm. you know investing it sort of going down a bit uh, economizing will say you don't have to work okay and a lot of people we, we have Are opting so out. the labor supply is behaving very differently from it used to so a tight labor market is because people are not coming into the labor market so Unemployment is low because the younger people are working. 
No, this, this has been discussed quite a bit. Uh, a friend of mine, my colleague, Charles Goodhart, he has a co-author whose name I forget. Yes, and, and he's speaking about inflation yeah, they have, in they the They have written a book about how labor force is going to Manoj Pradhan and... Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, this, this, he, they wrote this about four years ago. And so they could see it. And I think, so, we have to tr uh, treat the unemployment numbers, labor tightness numbers, with a bit of care. Because, yes, American markets look, look very tight right now compared to, say, European markets. Europe is in more financial trouble than, than America is. Well, you know, America ultimately can print any amount of money in the world will absorb it. The global demand for dollars is fantastic. And everybody else doesn't have that luxury. That, that's exactly why I'm asking whether, you know, the Fed can manage a soft landing or will it have to go, you know, no, nearly no. as much as Walker? As it's difficult to say, you know, it depends upon the course of the war, but uh, it won't be easy. It won't be easy. So I, I think I think a right high now, fa Fed funds rate for a longish bit is a likelihood. You know, in a sense, ultimately, I don't quite believe the real rate can be calculated very easily, but we've had a negative or zero real rate for a very long time. Yes. We've got to get out of the delusion. And I think Powell is still under the influence that he can, he can manage, but he can't. If the war goes on as I think it will go on, whether China does Taiwan or not, there's another story. I think the energy crisis is a very serious crisis. <clears throat> Even without the war, it was going to come because we had been neglecting climate change and all that. And <clears throat> Europe is really caught in an energy crisis because they they sold their soul to Russia, whatever it is. And in Germany, was being very, very creative. They wanted to compensate for all the damage they had done to Russia in the past yes. and all that sort of stuff. And so they shut down the nuclear plants and, you know, did this gas thing. Uh, I mean, in, from the point of climate change, it was a disastrous thing going. Anyway, now we are caught. Caught. UK isn't that dependent, but uh, you know, uh, there's also 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 you see because of the Chinese used to do a lot of UK uh, in nuclear energy. Now there's a problem: can we continue with the Chinese or not? Okay. That that's an unknown. So I think this crisis is not going away. America may look very powerful and all that, but. A breakup in the majority community, which has never happened so far, on serious political problems. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of right now studying India and America as two countries which have a majoritarian program. I think Americans are going to have more difficulty than they think they are going to have. But let me stop you there because I have to take a commercial break. Sure. But thereafter, questions on India. How does the India growth story look? Do we take advantage because of this China plus one or diversification China? All those questions to Lord Desai in a minute after the break. Welcome back to Indianomics. I've been speaking with Lord Desai, uh, the Indian-born British economist and uh, a Labour Party member for nearly 50 years before he resigned, I think because of Jeremy Corbyn. Well, uh, uh, Lord Desai, let me come to the Indian setup. Uh, do you think that we will be able to uh, navigate with some of the strengths because a lot of uh, Western manufacturers would be preferring a China plus one policy. Will that mean that uh, our prospects of growth and investment are better? No, I think, forget China. Uh, when you look at India, no, I think India was about 40 years after independence on rubbish strategies. Uh, now we have realized that we are actually not a hardware country, we are a software country. You know, we had this obsession about making machines to make machines and all that sort of stuff. Terrible. Then we went bankrupt. And uh, Nasim Rao and Manmohan Singh. See, now if you look at it, what are 
What is India valued for? India is valued for a fantastically highly skilled export of workers. Yes. You know, I was saying uh, the other day, uh, India used to export sugarcane workers to Mauritius, yes. to British Guiana, and all that. You know, they were indentured laborers. Yes. That was, you know, the, the and, 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 and the cycles of those, those uh, exporter people were very economically accurate. Now we are exporting, exporting Sundar Pichai. Okay. Right? Sundar Pichai runs the biggest. Now they are wanting Indian people to run corporations, to be the technical so solutions makers. So we have progressed. And I think we really ought to realize we are a service economy. We're not a manufacturer. Forget manufacturing. Money can be bought anywhere. Doesn't matter. So you we don't. don't, uh, we don't, we don't you so know, you're not other, impressed by this PLI scheme that the government has to attract more people into manufacturing through provision of subsidies. I think we ought to stop all that obsession with manufacturing. Manufacturing can be bought. We are the most efficient service economy going. Okay. Again, my, my, my analogy is, think of this economy as 20, 40, 40. Up to 20% are good enough to be in a developed country. Okay. Okay? In Rajiv Gandhi's time, this was called Bell India. There, there were enough number of people like in Belgium who were all right. Yes. Okay, there are now more than Belgium. So 20% is like Belgium. Yeah, yeah, 20, oh. 40, 40. A 20% rich Indians is 200 million people. Yes. That's one of the largest markets in the world going. Okay. Okay? People will sell their manufacturers here. Don't have to worry about it. Okay. We have a very good e-commerce structures. We have got fintech structure. And we have to get stop being obsessed about manufacturing. Okay. No, that's a fair point. No, I mean, if, as so a service let me, economy. Let me give one more example. My one more example is Bollywood. Bollywood has never manufactured film equipment. They have done great films. Yes. We are a software nation. We are not a hardware nation. Get out of the hardware obsession. The economics is about buying cheap. Now, let me take the other point that yeah. you have made, which is very important. This 20-40-40 economy. Yeah. Really, the, uh, the Indian market is only the top 20%. Uh, and we have several economists, Arvind Subarman, all of them worrying about it. Can we manage a, a, a sustained secular growth of 7% or more with just this kind of skewness in the economic distribution? We had, we had 5, 35, okay. 60. Okay. okay. We have okay. come to this after... Since 1991 to now, okay, okay, we had sort of 25, 30 years of growth, uh, having wasted 40 years. So, yes, India can do it, but India has to stop being obsessed about old-fashioned nonsense that we 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 convinced ourselves against evidence okay. that India was deindustrialized by the British. We had to have our own machine-making industry. All this other stuff. You know, everybody else in Asia, like South Korea, managed without that obsession. Okay. The South Koreans were colonized by the Japanese, but they still copied the Japanese model. No, suppose I accept your point that yeah. we don't obsess on manufacturing. Yeah. Uh, your point is that the skewness in income distribution need not, uh, uh, you know, be an obstacle to secular growth. Look, every other country in the world is capitalist. Mm. And capitalism works like that. Okay. Capitalism works on inequality. Makes the rich richer, yes. We want to overcome the inequality. Inequality won't be overcome by the state doing anything. Inequality will be overcome by having economic progress. Okay. Trust capitalism. Forget about everything else. We've been through all the thing about socialism. Socialism is gone. Even China is not socialist anymore. Can we just consider our strengths? And when I come to India, at this time especially, I'm very impressed by digitization, by fintech, yes. things like that. Now you see, what is coming next is artificial intelligence, robotics. India would be good at that. Yeah. We, we have a surplus labor, but we will not get anywhere by fighting robotics. We will invent probably the best robotics going.
and use we, it to create. Uh, yeah, we have people like that. We have very clever people. You know, for all these years of having IITs and IMs, now at last we can earn it's bearing fruit. fruit. Of that. So let us concentrate on those things and not be sentimental about, you know, make in India or Antioch. Antioch they will happen, not by worrying about it, but by concentrating on, you know, let the top 20% grow to top 40%. You know, we had a series of interviews on India at 75, and we were all looking at India at 100. Uh, one of the worries is, yes, we are the fifth largest economy now, but if you looked at us in per capita terms, know, we are 130th. I know. So I is that uh, likely to be an obstacle, or do you think... No, it's again and again I say, because we wasted 40 years in the wrong technology, and even now, with the BJP in power, rather, the manufacturing obsession doesn't go away. Somehow we believe that only manufacturing, making solid things, is good economics. Nothing is good. Forget about it. Economics is about buying cheap and you know and I, selling. I, 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 <laughs> selling <laughs> yeah. So I think what we have actually right the now in states. India, one of the most fantastic uh, e-commerce. Let me say one more thing. We had a very good industry. We had a world-class textile industry, which we destroyed. Out of our obsession for, oh, we must regulate consumer goods industries, we must invest in machine goods making industry, we destroyed it. Now, let's stop all that rubbish. We are old enough now at 50, to uh, 75, yes. to be able to do better. And socialism is gone as a possibility. Fair point. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Desai. That's very important advice uh, to concentrate on services and software where we do well and uh, to remember that uh, capitalism has served the world much better, socialism on its way out. Thank you very much indeed for joining us.